Hello, puppies and kittens. I am talking with a couple friends of mine from Ireland, uh, the Emerald Isle, who uh, I wanted to congratulate you guys because, uh, well, I'll let you, uh, Michael Nugent, and um, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't believe Jane, I haven't seen your moment. Jane. I'm, I'm thinking about what it, uh, what was it? When it, one of the, I'm not even, I'm not going to say her name, but there was another, there was another woman that was, that was working with me the last time I was in, in Ireland, and for whatever reason, her name jumped in. <laughs> I'm Jane right. Donnelly. Was that? Jane Donnelly is I'm Jane Donnelly. Okay, I was gonna say I was gonna say no, it wasn't Jane Donnelly, it was Ashley. Man, never mind. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. was probably Ashley O'Brien then that, that you were dealing with last time, was it? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, that's that, mystery, uh, so that lovely hotel. I just hate when I have those senior moments when you got a name at the top of your head and then suddenly <laughs> it disappears for like yeah. a whole minute. Anyway. Uh, so go, go go ahead and share your news. We have Atheist Ireland has got consultative special consultative status with the United Nations. It took us an awful lot of, of time, it was a couple of years in the making, and we had applied for it. And it means a lot to us because um, we do promote uh, human rights, particularly around the right to freedom of conscience, religion, and belief. And we've been working in this area for many years. I think I had looked it up and our first submission to the UN was in 2011. So we put an awful lot of work into the background and um, we've got it. Now, it's quite unusual for uh, an organization like ourselves um, to get um, something like this because it's usually kind of a number of organizations that combine different in different countries and, and that. So we are really, really pleased that we got it. Now we do go over to the UN and that when Ireland is up before the United Nations under various treaties and that. Um, and, and in relation to blasphemy before the, we got rid of the blasphemy law, that was one of the areas where that we brought up. Our education system is heavily influenced by the Catholic Church here. The abortion issue here, and those kind of issues we would have brought um, to the UN in relation to the laws and the constitution in Ireland. So um, we're, it's ongoing. So we will use this status as a tool to get our rights and to, to develop the area around freedom of religion and freedom of conscience of atheists, secularists, and the non-religious in generally in the world. Now, see, I, I'm, I've always been proud of you guys as far as activists, the two of you, because I remember, uh, first of all, there was the, the World Atheist Convention that where, where we met uh, in 2011, and you, you were hosting that event in Dublin uh, at the same time that there was a, there was a militant Catholic uh, YouTuber from, from Church Militant, Michael Boris, was it, uh, on that same weekend, unaware that we were doing the World Atheist Convention. He was in uh, Dublin interviewing Irish people. Now, he's from like, I don't know, Michigan or something like that. But he's he was frustrated that out of out of uh, 20 people interviewed, only one of them still believed in God. Like it was 19 yeah. atheists that he happened to find on the sidewalk. <laughs> yeah, we, we <laughs> found it, that since we started, Aaron, that, that, that one of the first things when we started, which was in 2008, we found out these, Aaron, and we yeah. were at the time uh, seeing one of our main goals as just normalizing the word atheism you know back then it was it, people didn't talk about atheism and, and it was like if you looked up the the parliamentary records any references to atheists would be either as a joke or as an insult or a reference to communist atheists or something like that but we've moved on now and, and we felt we find now that we've, we've certainly moved on past past that if you look at the parliamentary records now there's the, any references to atheists are typically parliamentarians citing atheist ireland briefing documents on the secular implications of, of legislation that's going through and so on so th so we've done that also the people have moved on the people of ireland you know we used to be a catholic country we're now a pluralist country but with catholic laws that we still have to gradually dismantle because the, the, the our constitution was passed in 1937, a very Catholic constitution. A lot of our laws are buttressed by that constitution. And so we're gradually getting rid of it. Like over, over, we've had three referendums in, um, in, in recent years. One, to allow marriage equality for, for gay couples. One, to remove the ban on abortion. Mm -hmm. 
and one to remove the law against blasphemy. Now, those three referendums, we've won them all by about a two to one margin. So there's a pretty much solid pattern there that that that, that, that about two thirds of the population are, are you know, are, are, are secular in terms of approaches to these issues. So we're very pleased, pleased with that. But it's still a, a drain on, on, on the the country trying to get the state to catch up on other issues. The Catholic Church still runs 90 percent of our primary schools. It has exemptions from our, in our equality laws that yeah. allows them to discriminate on the grounds of religion. Uh, so that we, we, you still have to swear a religious oath in order to become president or judge or Taoiseach, which is our prime minister. So those are issues that we're still campaigning on. And we also work, by the way, um, and I'll preface this by saying we promote atheism as, as a more reliable worldview than religion. Um, but we do that with the public. When we're dealing with the state, we say to the state, we would be just as opposed to the state promoting atheism as we are to the state promoting religion. You know, we can stand on our own two feet and argue the case for atheism being a more more rational worldview than, than faith. But but all we're saying to the state is you should be neutral between religious and non-religious beliefs. And in fact, the only way for the state to protect everybody's rights equally is for the state to remain neutral on those issues and, and allow people to sort them out ourselves. When you did the the World Atheist Convention, that was in uh, th that was a, a slap in the face to the people that were trying to pro pass the the blasphemy laws, or that had just recently tentatively passed a form of blasphemy law that was that was uh, the way it was phrased, as I remember, was it was virtually unenforceable. It was just this vague thing. So we have this huge atheist congregation uh, right there in in Dublin um, saying, "Hey, come get us." We're blaspheming the hell out of this place. <laughs> yeah, well, the difficulty, though, Aaron, is even though it, it, it was a vague enough law, um, the the media uh, who are who aren't there to mm. challenge, you know, more is they're there to make money by selling newspapers or, mm. or, or broadcasts. They're not interested in challenging laws, and they don't want to get involved in a uh, a blasphemy case, even if they're going to win it. So, in practice, the media self censored. Now that's gone now since we have the referendum yeah. and have removed it. But but it, it, it was a it was a more real issue yeah. that, than than you thought. We, we did, by the way, when it started, the Minister for Justice at the time we brought in the law was called Dermot Ahern. And we set up a, a religion called the Church of Dermatology to worship Dermot Ahern. And we had various beliefs, including that ice cream wafers were literally the body of Dermot Ahern and that we were protecting him for people blaspheming against him. And some of our supporters in the parliament read into the record when they were debating these, the blasphemy law, read into the record the beliefs of the Church of Dermatology and referred to, we have in the in the public gallery, the prophet Michael Nugent. And uh, so all of those there, I, I, we're, we're just imagining in a couple of hundred years times, future historians reading back on these and reading about this church and imagining, you know, maybe it's about as silly or about as reasonable as, as all the other churches. <laughs> so I wanted to, to give, give further congratulations because on a subsequent visit, a couple of years later, when I, as I remember when I came back to see you guys again, you were celebrating another victory because you you advocated a number of social issues and, and and was it the decriminalization of abortion or was it the the legalization of gay marriage? I don't remember which one it was right now because you, you had both. Nobody, uh, did... No, those both there was th that had to be put to the people under a referendum because, like yourselves, we have a written con constitution and so. Um, um, same-sex marriage was banned under our constitution and so was abortion so both those issues had to be put to the people in a re in a referendum and we were involved with both of those so um the referendum for same-sex marriage that was passed and then the uh, a referendum in relation to removing the ban on abortion from our constitution was also passed now we had been uh, campaigning on that um oh gosh for a good few years and we'd be we had gone over to the UN when Ireland was up complaining about that being in our constitution and um we were involved in that campaign and indeed we were out on the streets in relation to it because um we we joined all the marches and that and then in the last I always remember it in the last few days up to the referendum, standing in the main street in Dublin, handing out leaflets and 
And it was only in the last few days, it was a very tightly run uh, campaign. And it, we were very, very, I remember being totally engrossed in it, you know, and very worried about, about it and wanting it to change and on that. And we were giving out leaflets and, um, and I just noticed that a change that people were saying, oh, we're going to vote to remove it. And I said, I think there's hope, you know, because up to that, you had to have balance in the media. So you didn't really know whether it was going to go one way or the other, other, you know. So it, I, we got the feeling that there was a good chance. And we were taken aback by um, how much it passed by then, you know, that it passed. So that, that was really we were delighted with that absolutely yeah. that was a big thing for us there's yeah. actually an american angle to that um aaron which is if you remember uh the roe versus wade case in in um in america back in in the 70s um which made a, a, a abortion legal legal there too. well i, I know, I know yeah. that there's issues recently but but back in, back then um abortion was was illegal in ireland but it wasn't unconstitutional mm. and in in the early 1980s the Catholic Church here were concerned that there might be a similar case here to mm. Roe versus Wade. So they had this campaign mm. to make mm. abortion unconstitutional as well as illegal. Yeah. And so there was a referendum in the 1980s that added that yeah. ban into the Constitution. And it's it's only it's only in the, the last couple of years that we've managed to, to remove that ban. So 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 uh, and uh, unfortunately, you seem to be moving in the opposite direction yeah. now in, in, in America with the uh, Roe versus Wade be, being undermined. Well, I, I see the, the the overturning of, of Roe v. Wade is going to be something like when we went through the prohibition period. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's something that the religious right, with the, the few victories that the religious right get, once they get that victory, they realize what a punishment it is. Yeah. It, much yeah. like the belief system. If, if, if what they believed in was true, their heaven would become hell very quickly. I mean, over that period, it gradually dawned mm -hmm. on people, I think, that, that you can't, you know, you can't just ban abortion. It's, it's just not going to happen. So your, mm -hmm. your, your only choices are between mm -hmm. re between mm -hmm. regulated abortion and unregulated abortion. Mm -hmm. And, and and so so gradually it's 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 like we've a similar argument on another issue that, that we're campaigning on at the moment, which is the right to assisted dying. And again, it's the same thing. You know, you can you can put as many bans as you want in place, but ultimately, when um, people are are, are in, in personal philosoph philosophical conscience conditions, whether it's an unwanted pregnancy or you're dying and you want to die peacefully rather than, than in pain, people will act in accordance with their own conscience. And so the state has to has to react to that reality by regulating it rather than by just pretending that you're banning it and just making it dangerous. So now, uh, tell me more what it means to be a UN consultant. What what does that entail, or what does that enable? Well, it it means that we have greater access to um, various UN decision making bodies. It means we have access to more resources over there. Uh, we we can uh, at, at look. We we go over regularly anyway. When, when Ireland has been questioned under various treaties to the UN committees. Now, the UN committees enforce the, the, uh, the human rights treaties, but there's also a wider body, which is the, the, the UN uh, Council, um, which we now have access to on, under the consultative status. And we, we also work within Ireland. We work alongside the Evangelical Alliance of Ireland and the Ahmadi Muslim Community of Ireland, who obviously we disagree fundamentally on in terms of worldviews, but they're discriminated against as well in our, by the privilege that, that the Irish uh, state gives to Roman Catholicism. So we we can work as, as well as on our own behalf because we're with with the uh, the state we're we're promoting secularism rather than atheism. We can vindicate the rights of religious minorities as well as our own rights to to a state where everybody is treated equally in um in ireland the evangelicals are looking for secular education because they're a minority within the system over here and they know what religious discrimination feels like so they're looking for secularism <laughs> And I understand in the US, they'd be looking for a religious state. So there's a difference there uh, um, in relation to the evangelicals in Ireland. And the Ahmadi Muslims are persecuted by other, um, the Shia or um, what's Sunni. the Sunni, the Muslims. So 
they are mm. a minority uh, within, um, say, Islam, and it they're looking for secularism as well to protect their rights. So it's quite in fact one of our colleagues in the Evangelical Alliance mm. of Ireland, when he's in America, uh, is is telling his colleagues over there you should be promoting secularism yes. because secularism is fair to everybody and protects the rights of everybody. So and it's that's, kind that's of an interesting dynamic in different countries, you know. So there, we have some Mormons in this country that that because of the way that Mormons teach their history, which I recently found out is not correct, but the way that Mormons teach their their Mormon history, they they have a they usually are a little bit better tuned to what the value of secularism is. Uh, there was a Mormon prophet that said that there would never be a Mormon president, and I remember my my mother telling me that. Oh, okay, that your prophet said that there will never be a Mormon president. And then she voted for Mitt Romney for his presidential run. I'm like, what did you tell me about the prop? But they, but they, they conveniently forget these things. The, the thing is, is that Mormons understand better than a lot of other, and I'm going to call it a Christian denomination because Mormons believe they are Christian, uh, better than a lot of other Christian denominations, they understand what it means to be oppressed by the, by the religious majority. You know, they, they have the, the Mormon war that, that, the, the way they tell the story that they, they because you know every every denomination of Christianity wants to be so persecuted yeah. but the Mormons have this story that they were persecuted by you know the 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 governor and a militia in Missouri and so they, they were like the the evangelical Christians are the are the majority they're oppressing us all oh, we're persecuted so they need secularism to save themselves mm. right and so it, there are not many religion you know when when Christian when Protestant Christianity gets the upper hand, well, then suddenly they want to control everything. But when they're in your yeah. situation and Catholics run everything, every yeah. school yeah. and all of that, well, then then it's the bleeding that, oh, well, we need equal rights too. We should have a secular kind of, well, yeah. sure, you could have that until you get in charge and then you're going to try to change it, aren't you? Yeah. 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 And then, of course, to be fair, Aaron, there are, there are countries where, um, you know, such as China, you know, where, where you have... Uh, where all religions are in a minority and where atheists can be authoritarian as well. So, so I mean, the, the, the problem in terms of human rights is not whether you're religious or whether you're uh, atheist. The problem is whether you uh, accept human rights for everybody or, or whether you're authoritarian on behalf of whatever it is you believe. And we, we think it's very important to, to make that distinction. We, we as, as I say, we strongly promote atheism as a more reliable way to understand reality and as a more reliable way to understand morality. But we understand that other people have different beliefs about that, and we'll argue that they're wrong, and they'll argue that we're wrong. But we're happy to have those arguments on an equal playing field as long as the state doesn't come in either on their side or on our side. We think that's the key to 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 our work is is when we're dealing with the people, we promote atheism. When we're dealing with the state, we promote secularism. And, and, and when we're dealing with the state on secularism, we're happy to work with religious groups who also promote secularism. One of the fundamental misunderstandings that I see in a lot of political discussion is that even people who, who want less government see me as an enemy, though I also want less government because they're not thinking of the authoritarian versus libertarian axis. They're only able to perceive the black and white left or right. They don't understand. There's, a, there's another one perpendicular to that which is arguably more important. That's what you're talking about now. And the people who are who say they want less government are actually advocating for authoritarians every single time. And it, it, it's, it's difficult to get people to understand that, that second dimension that, that is impeding their own progress and making them more enemies than allies. But anyway, I wanted to, to say that I was very proud of you guys because every time I've come over, every time I've met, met you, uh, you, you had another success to celebrate that you were directly re, uh, involved in. And this time I'm not in Dublin, so I just uh, I'll, I'll have to do this as a, as a as a way to follow up. It was just good yeah. timing before that all your little uh, victories I happen to be there for. So yeah, you're 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 our lucky mascot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we did another one by the way, just literally last week. Yeah, one of our former officers, John Hamill, who I don't know whether you met him when you were over here, but he took a he, he's also runs oh. the church of the flying spaghetti monster in Ireland, and he took a case to the uh, Workplace Relations Commission and because he applied to be a military oh. chaplain, 
and he didn't get uh, considered, didn't even, you know, get a, a, a response from him saying he was interested in it. So he took a case saying that, that the military were uh, discriminating against him on the grounds of religion. And the Department of Defence. Yeah. The department, which is a government department, the Department of Defence, were discriminating against him. And, and he won his case. So the, the Department of Defence now have to change their policies yeah. on, on military chaplains because yeah. they have been giving them only to Catholic priests on the basis and, and their appointment procedure is just they ask the local bishop to nominate somebody and then they appoint yeah. that person. So now they're going to have to put in place a proper um, application yeah. process and a proper appointment process. Uh, you know, that would be what they would have to do normally during, the, you know, for civil service appointments. Uh, and they can't just be giving these things to, to, to priests. And some of it was scandalous. I mean, outside the, of the military, we also did some some research on chaplains in universities. Yeah. And they, they were the same thing. And, and they, would, they would give them houses. And in one case, university uh, college Cork or else Cork or TC, I can't remember which, paid to paint the house. Of of the chaplain that they that they appointed, it was just outrageous the privilege that they give to uh, Roman Catholic priests. In American media, I remember in like the seventies and eighties, uh, there were there were so many Catholic priests that were represented as having an Irish accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We well, we did send a lot of people over there, and yeah. and also unfortunately. Uh, during the the um, I'm not making any uh, aspersions about the priest that your particular priest you were talking to, but one of the things that the Catholic Church used to do when there were paedophile priests here is yeah, send them off to other them. countries, including yeah. America, Australia as well. And I don't think it's really broken in Africa, all that whole area. You know what I mean? Um, but there's terrible difficulties. There's a terrible legacy, you know, of sending paedophile priests abroad, just moved them out of the parish and um, they moved them to another area. They started abusing that and then they moved them to another country. So there's issues, major issues around that, that um, we're still coming to grips with, even though we had so many reports here um, in relation to um, clergy abusing children. And, and then there's all this do you know, it's just so entwined in our history, you know, the Madeline, the, the laundries and the industrial schools and it's just it's very very difficult still ongoing the campaign to get compensation for uh, the women that were in the laundries and the children that were run by um religious nuns mostly isn't it nuns mostly yeah, yeah. it's always nuns yeah that whole area is still ongoing in ireland so it is really different it's a particular kind of culture they seem to have it just integrated Catholicism right into all aspects of our culture. And a lot of people don't see see that. They don't see that we have a culture. They just think it's it's Catholicism and Catholicism is our culture. And they always, you know, people, Irish Catholics and Irish Ireland is Catholic and it's always been Catholic and all this kind of thing. So, it, I mean, our constitution actually starts with in the name of the Holy Trinity we the people of ireland so that's another area where we're trying to get changed yeah in the so, name of the holy trinity from whom all authority comes that's how <laughs> that's how our constitution starts yeah, <laughs> yeah what, I, I had a debate with a, a muslim around about the time that that trump was elected and i think it, i think it was just before he was in uh before he got into office but he, he had been elected and so we had this debate and uh I'm I'm arguing with these Muslims at dinner after the formal event, and they were concerned about one of them is an American citizen. He's concerned about the situation now because of the, the anti-Muslim bigotry and everything. And I said, well, you know, you and I fundamentally disagree on on theology and on science and a whole number of other things. And I I will take you to task all day long on those issues, but on the human rights issues, then I'm going to work with you because. I, I, I get the whole necessity of, of, of secularism and everything and, and, you know, as societal oppression or whatever. So I, I, I appreciate that, that, that we are of the same mindset there. Yeah. I think when you start lobbying and you lobby on the ground, not on social media now, but when you have to go to places and you have to go to debates and you have to make submissions and you have to make presentations to different government departments and everything like that, you meet people of all religions and other beliefs and and this thing and you just 
you can't be calling people names all the time or shouting at all, them all the time. It doesn't seem, it doesn't work. You know, you have to, when you're working to change the law or change the constitution, you have to have dialogue with people and you have to move forward. I don't care what anyone believes in. They could believe that there's people on Mars. I, go, I couldn't care less what anyone believes in, but, <laughs> but they can't have privilege and they can't discriminate against other religions and beliefs. And when you start lobbying on the ground, you realize that you have to be around all these people all the time, no matter what beliefs they have. And some of them have the strangest beliefs that you, you couldn't possibly, <laughs> that's not based in, any, in science anyway, and it's not based on rationality in any way, but you just get on with it because this is what we do. You just get on with it. Our purpose is to change laws, to change the constitution, to stop religions having privilege and to stop the discrimination against atheists and humanists and secularists. And that's what we do. So you just move forward all the time. And come shouting at people on social media is not working on the ground to change laws and policies. I was accused of being a humanist before I ever knew what a humanist was. I was accused <laughs> of being an atheist before I knew what an atheist was. Yeah. I was accused of being a Satanist long before I was yeah, a Satanist. Yeah, we get that as well. <laughs> I didn't know what a Satanist was. Yeah. And so when you talk about calling people names, what what I see in this country, and I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. sure it's the same in Ireland, is that the labels don't mean what you think it means when you yeah. lob that label at somebody. Yeah, you know? yeah. So we, we have so many people that are complaining about secularism, don't know what secularism is. They honestly yeah. don't. They complain about evolution. They don't know what evolution is. <laughs> they yeah. don't know what atheism is. They don't know what Satanism is. They don't know what, what we, when a Protestant describes an atheist, it's very different than the way an atheist describes themselves. And likewise, the way that an atheist would describe general Christians is probably going to be somewhat deviant from the way the, the Christians would define themselves. Mm -hmm. I've seen Christians define themselves literally as just being better than everyone else because they... <laughs> They, they yeah, know. there's, there's nothing there, Ireland is is that in in Ireland, like Ireland is typically seen as a Catholic country, and 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 in fairness, the majority is still nominally Catholic. Mm. Uh, but there was a survey done when the when the Catholics had their um, world uh, Eucharistic Congress in in, in Ireland about, about maybe seven or five or six, or six yeah. years ago, mm. and there was a survey done, like a proper survey with a market research team and they were asking the, the, Catholics, the, the yeah. Catholics their mm. opinions on various things. And there were a few things. One is that is that is that um most of the Catholics, 75% of them didn't believe in in uh transubstantiation, transubstantiation yeah. which is the the for those who aren't aware of it, it's it's the, the theological belief that the communion bread literally becomes the body of Christ as opposed to metaphorically. Mm. Most of them uh, didn't believe in hell, most of mm. them didn't accept the moral authority of the Pope, most of them had their own personal relationship with uh, a God. So if you look at that objectively, most Irish Catholics are actually Protestants. You know, <laughs> those, those are the beliefs of Protestants. <laughs> Um, so, so, the, and and most are uh, certainly a lot of of, of the liberal end of yeah. Irish Protestants um, don't even believe in God. So, I think everybody is kind of a step closer to reality yeah. than their than their title might suggest. And and what what I was just saying, virtually nobody that I that I argue with in this country. I mean, they they, they all hate liberals and leftists and communists yeah. and socialists, but they don't know what any of those words mean yes. either. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and in fact, one of the things that, that social media has done uh, is is that mm -hmm. the words, particularly in America, I think from a distance, that the word liberal seems to be attached to people who are behaving in quite an authoritarian way, and and it, it just doesn't mean liberal in in the sense that that most of us would have considered liberal to mean mm -hmm. in in classical terms. Yeah. And then classical liberalism is not what they're referring to when they say liberal most mm -hmm. often. So. Again, the labels, just as Jane said, that when you throw names at somebody, you're you're using labels, then you have your own definition for that, and it doesn't match the way they self-identify. So the the label is meaningless. Mm. It's much more important to like you know get the dialogue. 
Yeah. And so, then the difficulty is, is is particularly the way and, and again, I would blame social media for, for, for a large amount of this this uh, development is that people tend to congregate in, in just little uh, social media bubbles of people that already agree with them. And everybody inside the bubble are good people and everybody outside the bubble are evil people. And, and, and so what the labels serve to do for people is it's just a marker. Are these people within my bubble or are they outside my bubble? And if they're outside my bubble, I can just dismiss what they say because because they're they're mm. witches, you know. And if they're in my bubble, it doesn't matter what they say because they're on my side. Yeah. So confirmation bias and genetic fallacy. We'll just we'll just lump in all the fallacies together. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Well, um, Jane, Michael, is great talking to you again. Congratulations on on not just not just this thing that with, you know, with the UN, but on your on your success as activists in the entire time that I've known you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you again whenever yeah. you're over next. Yeah, great. <laughs>